you for tuning into IoT Connect, where we're covering some of the most interesting topics, trends, and news around the Internet of Things. IoT Connect is brought to you by Teal, a wholly owned, patented eSIM platform that's helping to connect any IoT device to any network around the world. Now, I'm excited to welcome you all to this episode of IoT Connect. If you're like us and you're passionate about IoT, be sure to click that subscribe button below and be sure to like this video so you don't miss a beat. Today, I'm excited to welcome Rob Tiffany to our show. Rob is a technology executive, digital strategist, and U.S. Navy submarine veteran. A best-selling author, podcaster, and keynote speaker, his thought leadership ranges from the Internet of Things to sustainability to mobile. He's designed and developed software used by the world's largest organizations. Rob serves on the boards of Smart Cities World, the Washington State IoT Council, and KPO's Health. He's the executive director of the Moab Foundation, focused on global sustainability, and is routinely ranked as one of the top IoT experts and influencers in the world by Inc. Magazine and others. Rob loves to deliver keynotes at industry conferences all over the world. He's published dozens of articles found in leading technology publications, as well as seven best-selling business and technology books. Rob, welcome to the show. Wow, that was a mouthful. Thanks for having me. Well, Rob, you've had a storied career and there's a lot to cover. To that end, I'd love to kick things off. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your story, your journey, and how you became so passionate about IoT. Sure. You know, um, it, it was a, it's probably real practical stuff, as it turns out. Um, yeah, you know, right after I got out of the Navy doing submarines, I was looking for a job and ended up joining a startup in Bellevue, Washington. It was literally called Real-Time Data. And the and this was in the mid 90s. And so before people were talking about M2M or IoT or anything like that, I mean, you didn't even, was, we were barely had cellular networks, actually. It was pretty primitive back then. Um, but the, the there was this basic premise, the guy who started this company, he wanted to monitor vending machines and Basically, it's an inventory management story, uh, but it turns out it's really analogous to lots of stuff people are doing today. Um, you know, think about every scenario where someone has to drive somewhere in a truck, walk somewhere, get on a plane, get on a boat, whatever. I've seen people get in helicopters, but they have to go visit some place and look with their own eyes to discover the current state, the current status, the inventory a reading on a gauge, um, the health of something, you know? And so in this case, no one was thinking about IOT or any kind of hyped thing like that. It was just kind of like, well, right now in vending, in the vending industry with vending machines around the city, you have people who every morning load up their pickup truck and they have a route, like lots of things in life. Actually, lots of people and businesses have routes that they drive around or that they are in charge of. And so someone would have to drive around their route. They fill up the back of their truck with, you know, candy, donuts, Cokes, Pepsis, whatever to go. And, and they drive and visit all these vending machines in their part of the city that they're in charge of to see, do I need to restock these items or not? And so our idea back then with real-time data was really simple. It was how could we use this new wireless technology that's bubbling up? And then again, it was pretty primitive back then, as you can imagine, especially the notion of wireless data. You know, it was it was weak enough just trying to get phone calls. You know, it was analog cellular back then. Um, and so we were like, well, gosh, if we had the way for the vending machine to talk to us and tell us, hey, I need more donuts or Snickers or Sprite or whatever instead of mindlessly visiting all this stuff, then I could really add efficiencies to that whole process. So talk about the, uh, you know, a trial by fire. You know, I'm a stupid kid with a lot of these older gray beard guys who are so smart. We had guys from Allied Signal. We had RF engineers. We had the people who actually created the black box on aircraft, uh, oh, wow. just serious people. Uh, we had, so we, you can imagine, I, was, I think about three different teams. You had a team who was building this embedded hardware and software for to go inside a vending machine, burning EPROMs. I don't know if you kids have ever heard of that term. It's been a while. Um, and then uh, radio frequency, RF engineers. We had to build our own wireless modems. 
literally. And we'd come wow. and build our own packets and bounce packets off of these. They had business radio towers. We used all kinds of technology to pre-eyed coverage. Because, you know, if you think of a city like a, a pie or a pizza, you might have coverage for this wedge from this technology and this other wedge of the pie, but totally different technology. There was It was not like what we have today. It was cellular. Um, and so, yeah, it was really difficult. And the other team where I was was building the stuff on a, a PC, Windows application that, that was graphical and it looked like you were looking at a vending machine. So you could see all the Cokes and candy and stuff like that. And in each slot, you know, a vending machine with candy, it's kind of like little spirals that move to push yeah, the chips yeah. out. So for every spiral, we'd have little icons that look like Fritos or whatever, white powdered donuts and a number showing how many are in there. And so those kind of three teams working together and vending machines were dumb back then. There's no intelligent anything. And so it was cables, mechanical things, turning, stuff like that. So we had to make dumb vending machines smart. We had to make them connected. Uh, and then we had to pull out, the, there was no cloud. <laughs> So you can imagine, so the way, the way it would work, uh, someone who was you know, a route driver who would stock a vending machine, they would go in there when they would unlock the door and open it to start putting stuff in there. They would have this handheld terminal that lo looked like a calculator. It was just nine digits and a little LCD display, black and white display. And they'd go, okay, for spiral number one, you know, A1 right at the top, I'm putting in Fritos and I'm putting 10 of them in there. And so that's how we kind of reset and know that everything's fully stocked. And so our embedded stuff, we had cables in there looking at when the spirals are turning and stuff like that. Um, and then all these crazy networks that we had to munch together. And we would literally, so our software running on a PC back then would literally reach out over the network and pull the embedded software box that was inside the vending machine. And we put antennas on top of the vending machines. Um, so that was crazy. And, and we would pull and we only talk to each machine. And so over time, that little black box with its software is looking at how many times spirals are turning, how many quarters people were putting in. They didn't have credit cards for vending machines back then. Mm -hmm. Things like an exact change light, that turns out that was a thing. If you could only accept exact change, that would hurt your sales. Because a lot of people are like, oh, I can't do it. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so what's the point of all this? You want to know, instead of mindlessly going everywhere, instead in the morning, we start creating reports. And so in the morning, the person would see a report and says, I need to actually visit just this, this, and this machine, and I need to bring just these items. And so, you know how people talk about truck rolls and yes. cost, you know, expense of fuel, wear and tear, and all that kind of stuff. So obviously, we reduced, dramatically reduced <laughs> truck rolls. Um, we were very precise, and this kind of applies today when we talk about other things like precision agriculture, or precision everything, just the right amount, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so we could do that. And so now, instead of a person visiting the machine to discover what's what's going on with the inventory, the machine's talking to you. And so that made things really efficient. Um, you know, along the way, we learn things because you know how sometimes you're heading down a path and then you kind of stumble upon new things that you didn't think about. Of course, you know, we're just bumbling, stumbling through life, right? Cool. So one of the cool things was, huh, we noticed if you, you know, a lot of times you have a bank of vending machines, a bunch of them together. We noticed like in different buildings or skyscrapers or wherever around a particular city, we could start to discern in real time the preferences of the people who were near those machines. And so I'll like give you an example. Let's say it's a vending machine, like three vending machines on the third floor of a skyscraper. And maybe there's a law firm or an accounting firm there. And it's the same people using those machines every day. All of a sudden we go, hey, we noticed those white powder donuts are selling out really fast. What if we doubled up or tripled the amount of donuts, you know, across two or three spirals? Because we could tell in real time the preferences of the customer. Well, Lo and behold, now magically that machine is making more money than it was making previously. So we're already saving them customer money through efficiencies and stuff like that and not wasting time going places. We're more precise on what they need to order for inventory. And now all of a sudden we know what people want. 
And so we are making more money. And then guess what? On the flip side, we also saw, saw the total loser items in the machines uh -huh. that nobody was buying. You know, when someone fills a vending machine, initially they just kind of go, well, what are the popular national brands that everybody likes? And I think that's where you start. But then over time, the local people, you start to find out their preferences. And so you can fine tune. And the cool thing about wireless technology and software is that we could do that quickly. And so pretty soon we got rid of the products that weren't selling and we were filling it with the stuff that people actually wanted right there. And so it was kind of magical. Um, and that was a long time ago, but those same principles apply across so many industries today. Oh my gosh, totally. It's crazy that features like that are so prevalent across leading online shopping platforms and we're so used to them, but to find out that the beginnings really started with these initial IoT applications that were really simply making dumb things smart. I love it. And you touched on other industry verticals that were historically dumb and not smart from a technological standpoint. But today, things like precision agriculture is becoming very sophisticated. And I know that you've done some work in connected agriculture. Can you talk about some of these solutions that are improving farming and helping to solve some of the challenges that farmers are facing? Absolutely. Um, I've done a bunch of this industrial IoT stuff in factories and you're like, hey, I wonder if we can apply these same concepts to plants, to crops, <laughs> you know, to apple orchards, yeah. things like that. And it turns out you can. I mean, what is IoT really? I'm just measuring something. I'm just remotely knowing the state, the health, the, uh, some value of something in real time because of software, wireless, hardware, microcontrollers, things like that. And so a farm is no different. What if farmers or all the people who work on farms, what are they doing every day? You know, they're walking through rows of crops or they're driving tractors through or combines or whatever, and they're discovering where pests are. They're discovering, hey, this area needs to be watered. A lot of people, a lot of places are irrigating farms the way they've done forever, just on some kind of random schedule. Like every afternoon we're gonna turn up, just like you might do at your house. We're turning on the sprinklers at four o'clock or whatever. There was no rhyme or reason to it until it started to really matter. Um, if anyone's checked out what's going on in California, the water is gone and California accounts for 40% of a lot of the agriculture in the United States. And so all of a sudden things that maybe you kind of took for granted, like in the Pacific Northwest, it never stops raining. And so people in Seattle don't think about it as much. And actually even on Eastern Washington, like this year, for instance, we're like three X the amount of snowpack in the Cascade Mountains. And so we got more water than we know what to do with. But if you go a few hundred miles further south to California, it's, it's you know, you know all time drought. And so now I have to be just like I did with the, the vending machines being very precise, just the right amount of water, the right amount of pesticide, the right amount of fertilizer. You may have heard we've got a fertilizer shortage. Um, we're gonna have massive wheat shortages and food shortage. So, what we did is we built devices. Uh, when you're doing stuff outside, unlike inside of, in a building or a factory, you have to weatherproof your devices and sensors because it rains and snows and bad things happen or critters are out there, right? So we built devices, kind of a weatherproof device. We had cellular, we had LTEM uh, and NBIT actually, and we had um, temperature, humidity, air quality, grove connectors to plug into the soil like an external connector from the device so we could plug uh soil moisture sensors into the ground oh cool yeah exactly and so and then we have to deploy these so it's different like if you're in row crops like in the midwest but not just, it's a lot of places then those you know cro crops you know wheat corn going on forever and a lot of times you might use drones or tractors to do that if you're doing some specialty crops like I did last summer, it was apple orchards. Well, obviously those trees don't move around and we don't harvest them by using a combine going over them. Same with hops, um, which I also did. So we deployed these devices out there. Um, and you know, what was amazing was the ability to get real-time data and show farmers, the heads of these large farms, all of a sudden their farm was talking to them and they didn't have to go visit. Um, you know, there's a tie-in to Teal because I became a Teal customer in this case. 
Uh, and it's not like I'm doing a teal pitch or anything like that. <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I, I needed some kind of connectivity, right? I needed, mm -hmm. and in the case I was using cellular, so I was going to use cellular for IoT. Um, there was a company I was going to use that had global coverage. Um, but interesting things happen. They are kind of like use. They kind of go through different mobile operators that use their system, and the operator they happen to be using was recently acquired by another mobile operator. And therefore, and that, that new operator said, we're not using this technology anymore. And they sunsetted it, they shut it down. So through mm -hmm. the acquisition of this operator, all of a sudden, this global product was no longer in existence in the United States. So I couldn't use that. Um, I was gonna use something from a large mobile operator, MNO, um, and, um, had some weird paperwork problems, but so the last minute I knew about Teal because I'm in this space. You know, I, I, you know, I was at Ericsson, and so I was part of the team with with our IoT accelerator, which is a competing product. And so I already knew about Teal and what they were doing, and so I literally reached out over LinkedIn um, to to someone that I was connected with, um, and they were like, "No problem." I it, like within minutes, it's like, "Oh my gosh, I have an emergency." I have to have, I'm going live with a pilot in a week and I don't have SIMS and I have connectivity or anything. I had SIMS the next day, eSIMS in this case, uh, which is a whole other story that people don't know about. Um, and they, I plugged them in there, got, a, you know, I was sent a box, you know, with the SIMS, easy to use instructions, almost like kind of like from going to IKEA <laughs> to show me how to get it started. Uh, got lots of help. There was this online portal and it's like, yes, you know, you can be this generic roaming thing and then you can switch it and choose your operator. And what I really loved was the one penny per megabyte. Because in, so in agriculture, I was just sending little chirps of data. Once an hour, I was sending soil moisture, air quality, temperature, humidity, a few things like that. So tiny bits of data, it wasn't going to use much. So it wasn't like I was needing some big giant pipe to send video or something like that. And so that worked out perfectly. And so, yeah, got up and running with Teal. And so super great experience for me as a customer. And it just worked. And then I, I didn't really think about Teal again because I didn't have to. It just worked and we deployed the stuff. And it, so the, the heads of these farms were just blown away. Literally the same day we deployed these devices and put them in the soil and everything. Telemetry was coming back through this software system I built. We were routing data, a lot of customers maybe have their own analytics systems. In this case, some of them were using, you know, you might be familiar with Snowflake, which is a database in the cloud. Uh, they were using Tableau. And literally by the end of that day, people had iPads see, looking at heat maps from Tableau of data and where soil moisture and uh, different so nutrients were. And those guys were blown away. I was personally kind of blown away too. I was like, wow, that just happened <laughs> really fast. And so it's amazing when things just work, isn't it? Um, but that's what you should expect, I guess, right? <laughs> well, that's what we'd expect, uh, but that's not always the case. Um, it's wonderful to hear, and Teal really is a game changer as a true eSIM platform. Um, with eSIM being very new, I would love to hear from you from a customer standpoint, uh, what you perceive as some of the benefits of using eSIM technology over other competing solutions. Absolutely. Um, and this might be new for a lot of people who don't know, like the mobile operator space or don't come from the telecom world like like you or I do. Um, so everybody probably has a SIM or they've used a SIM or they might see a SIM like when they bought a smartphone, you know, or a flip phone or something like that. And it's a little plastic card and you pop it in there and that's and a SIM is has a one to one connection with a particular mobile operator. So as a customer, you signed up with some mobile operator. Uh, and you have a subscription with them and you're paying so much per month, you know, for voice and data and things like that and text messages. Um, so then there's these other groups of companies out there. They're not MNOs, mobile network operators. They're like a virtual network operator. Um, gosh, I can think, I can give you lots of names, you know, but I won't, but, but, they're, they're, but they're, they're smaller usually. And I'm still talking about smartphones and voice, which people use. And so, you might see them in rural areas. They're all over the place. And uh, basically the gist of it is these giant mobile operators, it turns out they may have extra excess 
data capacity or stuff like that. And they can do sell that off at wholesale rates. And so, and they might use these mobile virtual network operators who kind of piggyback on their network to actually help them go after maybe different segment market segments than they go for. Maybe you're a mobile operator and you're going after some high end segment for iPhones and Galaxy devices, but you still want to make money and sell data to different segments. And so there's the mobile, these virtual mobile network operators actually serve a great role because they help fill in those gaps. And so they buy this extra data at wholesale rates from these operators. So a lot of times, if you're with this MVNO thing and you're getting a lesson here, kids, um, it's usually a one-to-one -one relationship with a particular operator. They don't tell you, you think you're running on their network, but they're piggybacking on another one. Um, now in IoT, you can do the same thing. And then you have some of these virtual network operators that actually maybe kind of triage or they have agreements with multiple real operators. And so they build all this data center infrastructure. You'll still go through the same cell towers that were built previously by these mobile network operators, but you'll go for their infrastructure of this virtual operator that maybe has agreements with a few different players. And that what they do is it's roaming typically. So if you've ever had your smartphone and you went to another country, for instance, and in the past, maybe you had to call ahead to your operator and say, hey, I'm going to go to Spain. And they're like, yes, we're, when I want data, and we're going to charge you this much per day for data. And it was a lot of money. Okay. Uh, and then there's some newer ones where it's just magic. I, I think today I, I'll be in my airplane and I'm landing at Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam and I get a text message that says, welcome to the Netherlands. You're now roaming on there. And so it's kind of cool. So there's a bunch of these virtual operators that do that. And so they roam and that's how they're creating coverage for, in case in the event that your IoT solution needs global coverage or multi-region coverage. Um, like if you have connected vehicles, connected mm -hmm. fleets of trucks that are maybe crossing boundaries, borders. Uh, and so that's important. And so they create coverage at a big scale through roaming. Turns out though, there's this weird problem. What you don't realize it is these other operators in different countries, they don't want you to just camp out on your network forever. They made an agreement for you to roam temporarily, like you're on vacation or on a business trip, and then you're gone. It's a courtesy that these operators are doing with each other. But the idea of you being there permanently, using their bandwidth and their resources all the time, they prefer their own customers, like in their country, like country people in Spain, people in the Netherlands, not a bunch of Americans using their bandwidth and all the time. So they'll actually kick you off the network eventually, uh, which is no good. Uh, some don't let you roam at all. So what was interesting about Teal, and this is a new thing, this eSIM thing, and eSIM has been talked about and there's lots of, you know how we have these working groups and specs and bodies put together, but it takes a while for the ball to really get rolling. So what's interesting about Teal, is it's, it's not a big network operator, like all the big ones you can think of that you might have a subscription with, but they're also not one of these virtual operators that's roaming around either. Um, it's just like this cloud software, a platform, uh, you know, this, you know, we, all we all know like software as a service kind of SaaS type things. All Teal is really doing is over the air, talking to your, this advanced eSIM and saying, I'm going to give you a local credential with this particular mobile operator. And all of a sudden you will be, it's like you're one of those home local people who actually is subscribing with that operator all the time. And so you're going to get all the love because they, that's who they want. Right. And so what was cool about Teal and I remember using the portal when I was doing the agriculture thing, I literally could go online and just point and click and say, oh, I want to be connected to this one. Oh no, I want to be that to this. And, and there's not, and it's not just for fun. You know, different operators may have different coverage characteristics or performance or things like that. And so, and you can imagine, you know, if you're in a dense urban area, if you're in rural, uh, they're all different, right? Nobody has complete coverage of the US. It's like a patchwork quilt. And so what was great with Teal is since it's eSIM and it's just got this SaaS thing, this credentialing deal that just says, okay, Rob, your, all your IoT devices are now part of this operator. Now they're part of that operator. And that operator doesn't go, oh, you're roaming. The operator goes, oh, you're, you're part of the home team. We love you. And so that's what happens. And it just worked. 
Um, and so if I was doing an international scenario, I wouldn't have that danger of being kicked off of those networks. Uh, those networks would treat me just like I'm one of their local subscribers. So I know it's nuanced. I know not everybody gets it. I know a lot of people that don't even want to get it or know it. Well, a lot of people are just trying to solve problems, right? They want a solution that just works. And so, uh, and so, yeah, it's pretty cool. I know we kind of geeked out there a little bit. No, I think it's very helpful. The differences are nuanced. Rob, you, you put it to me simply once that with Teal, you can stop roaming like a tourist and you can live like a local on your home network. I think that really simplifies what we do. It's like Rick Steves Europe. I'm going to show you how to live like a local instead of just being a tourist, going to all the touristy places. It's always better. <laughs> exactly. Thanks for that. Uh, you're a wonderful teacher, Rob. And one of the things that I'd be curious about is with you, what are some of the most important IoT innovations that you see on the horizon that get you the most excited? People who know me probably realize I'm really into the digital twins. Um, you know, IoT is made up of so many components, right? There's the, there's the hardware, there's sensors, there's embedded software, there's the connectivity that makes it all happen. There's servers, there's storage, there's analytics. Because in the end, we're not doing science experiments, even though I think the last decade has been full of IoT science experiments. Um, mm -hmm. Now people are like, I need business results. I need to take actions on insights. Um, one way I have found that's really it's easier for people to get their heads around is this digital twin thing. And all that really is, is a, it's a digital representation of a physical object or, or a process. And so when I can have a digital version of your car, for instance, you know, your car's got four tires, it's got an engine, it's got a gas tank, it's got whatever, all these attributes, or maybe it doesn't have a gas tank, maybe it's electric. Um, and so it has all these attributes about it. And so what you do is you create a kind of a data structure um, when you think about kind of database type stuff. And so you, you, you create a data structure that's digital that looks and mimics the real thing in the real world. Um, and then IoT is the plumbing. So I create a structure that, where the digital car looks just like the physical one, but then when the physical one is moving and it's alive and it's going and wheels are turning and things are happening, you're sending that telemetry over IoT, over wireless data networks, and then they go in and they kind of get, uh, this is, sounds so geeky, get hydrated, whatever, that, that latest <laughs> state of data. But, it, but basically it, it hydrates that digital twin and it becomes alive. And then every time a little bit, you know, if you're sending data once a minute or once a second, you're always getting this latest state of health and performance and everything you want to know about your car, for instance. And so... And people can kind of get that. I know a lot of people hear digital twins and they think, oh, is that some kind of AI thing? Or is there a neural network hiding in there? It doesn't have to be that way. Um, it's just a great way of managing assets actually and processes. And uh, I found over the years, I've you know, helped build and design Azure IoT, you know, did Lumata at Hitachi doing giant industrial stuff. I worked with really smart people and a lot of times the smartest people want to focus on the geekiest, most obscure fringe technologies that maybe are the best. But I think my experience over the years is it turns out making things easy and understandable to people means more. There's always a lot of ways to skin the cat, right? When you're doing something. And so uh, digital twins turns out when someone can see a digital version and go, oh, I get that. Oh yeah, the PSI in the right front tire is 29 PSI and it should be 32. And you say, well, you know, I could apply KPIs, key performance indicators to those values and trigger events, alerts, you know, what's it supposed to do? You know, if, if uh, it, and, and this is stuff that people can understand. The reason I talk about a car with digital twins, especially if you have a, a newer car, if you look at your dashboard, when you bring your car, when you turn it on, there is so much information looking on the display. There's so much more data than you've ever seen in your life on all the stuff going on on your car. It's amazing. Um, and you can sometimes scroll through and just see so much stuff. All IoT is, is taking that stuff you're seeing on your dashboard and just sending it over wireless somewhere else where we can then make the digital version of what you're seeing. And then you can get insights from it. You know, how does your car know how fast you're going? Did you know there's no such thing as a speed sensor? It's actually a combination of things to figure out what your speed is. 
that has to do with RPMs and a few and friction and all kinds of other things to determine that. And so uh, anyway, when you can bring all that stuff in one place where you, then you can analyze it uh, and then derive some insights from it, um, that's where the magic happens. Uh, but it doesn't have to be rocket science. It could just be you're running low on gas. The air pressure or in your right hand tire is too low. Really similar to the vending machine coils that you visualized. And yes. You're able to know, you know what what the inventory count was and, and absolutely buying what and that was almost like a very early digital twinning, right? Like very. All those you know, we ago. we kind of had to do that without getting too geeky. There's this idea of a digital twin model or a prototype, which is basically think of an asset class. Or if I go back to the the vending thing. We literally had the schematics for every from all the popular vending machines that people were using because we had to know how they work because we were going to retrofit them with cables and weird stuff. And so we would build stuff based on the schematics of a, an asset class, this type of vending machine. But then there's thousands of instances in the real world of that type of vending machine. And so your digital twin model is the type of the thing. And then the digital twin instance kind of inherits all the features of that that model, if that makes sense. And so, uh, you know, if I'm doing a model of a Mercedes GLE 350 from 2018 and all of its attributes, and then I have a million instances of that. I have your Mercedes and Fred's Mercedes and Sally's Mercedes or whatever. And so it, you kind of, it, it all inherits, you don't have to figure out the, attributes over and over again for each one. You just do it one time for the model and everything. Anyway, this is getting pretty nerdy stuff here, but it, it, it makes life easier. It reduces work you have to do. Uh, Cause what you don't want to do is just make people start to throw up their hands. You know, when we're doing business with folks with IOT and analytics, you're working with regular folks that are at some company and they have a job to do. They have a thing to accomplish. And they don't know what AI is and they don't understand what neural networks are or why they should even care. They just want something that's understandable to them and it's gonna move that needle. I often talk about the value needle. Um, maybe I should register or trademark that. Anyway, the value needle, am I making money? Am I saving money? Am I improving employee safety, uptime, things like that. Those are the kind of a lot of the basic things where people do IoT on there. And so I found a lot of times that value needle can move 10%, 20% just on the easy stuff. Um, I always encourage people to go after a low hanging fruit in IoT. Uh, don't jump, don't feel like you're not gonna get value unless you're using some bizarre AI thing that no one understands. Always go, there's so much value to be had just from simple stuff. Just back to the vending thing. We didn't have advanced anything. We had a simple database. And we were just doing simple queries back then. We didn't have all the crazy stuff that people are using today, right? What was the value? The value was instead of a person visiting a vending machine to find out what I need to do with it, the vending machine just told me wirelessly in real time. That was the value. It saved me money. I didn't need a neural network or AI or robots from the future uh, to do that. That stuff applies today. When yes. I would do executive briefings at Microsoft for Azure IoT, I can't tell you how many people I would do briefings for in like in the oil and gas industry. And they go, well, yeah, I get in my pickup truck and I go out to the oil tank farms in West Texas and I put a big stick in the tank. And that's how I find out how much oil is in there. And I'm like, really? And when I saw more than one person tell me that, I realized, oh, wow, I'm not crazy. Maybe the world's not as advanced. A lot of times we all are kind of in our own little echo chamber because we're in the tech industry. It turns out things aren't as sophisticated as you think you are. And so when you say, well, what if I put a little sensor that told you how much oil was in the tank and through the magic mm -hmm. of cellular, you could just know without sending someone in a pickup truck to go find out and put a stick in it. And it's like, yeah, we'd save so much money. That'd be great. There's the value, you know? So a lot of times, and you know what? Those are things people understand. Every employee you would talk to at a customer's company, they would instantly get that. They go, absolutely. Instead of you, you know, I remember early on when I was doing stuff um, with Lumata at Hitachi, I remember reading an article, I think it was about Shell Oil doing something in Africa. And they were literally flying someone once a month uh, to this country in Africa 
to find out the state gauges, all kinds of things about what was going on there. And as soon as they just put sensors to do that job and send it back wirelessly, you know, they came back and they added it all together. And there was this whole deal. It's like, yeah, we're saving $10 million a year by just wow. not having to do these things, not from rocket science, just talk to me wirelessly instead of me getting on airplanes and stuff like that. Um, so lots of, lots of value to be had from easy stuff. Absolutely. Making these historically archaic industries smart in ways that everyone can understand is, is wonderful. Well, Rob, there's so much that we didn't have time to cover today, and we're going to have to have you back on the show. I really appreciate you coming on today. And for all of our listeners out there who want to learn more about you and all of the cool things that you're up to, where can they find out more? Just just find me on LinkedIn. I usually probably overshare on LinkedIn <laughs> or, or at Rob Tiffany on Twitter. Uh, is probably another good spot. Or check out IoT Coffee Talk, a competing podcast to this, <laughs> to this very fine podcast. <laughs> I'm still waiting for our invitation. I actually think you just had our founder on your show, so that's great. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Easy to find, though, for sure. Well, there you have it. If you're like us and you're enthusiastic about IoT, be sure to like this video and click that subscribe button below so you don't miss a beat. Be sure to listen in to future episodes of IoT Connect. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in. And thank you, Rob, for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. This has been great.